Now that we've discussed the quantum mechanics, let's move on to the quantum model of the atom. As you recall previously, we discussed the Bohr model of the atom, which is ultimately incorrect. One of the reasons why was that in the Bohr model, electrons follow circular orbits around the nucleus. And as it turns out, circular orbits are too simple. So in the quantum model, electrons reside in what we call atomic orbitals that are a lot more complicated than circular orbits. These atomic orbitals can be described in terms of their size slash energy. And this is similar to the Bohr model in that this is based on the energy level or the shell. We can also talk about the shape of each orbital, which depends on the subshell. And finally, within each orbital, we can talk about the spin of the electrons inside, and that can be either up or down. So to start off with, let's take a look at orbital size slash energy. Similar to the Bohr model, the size of an orbital is determined by the energy level slash shell, which is indicated by the principal quantum number. Now, a lot of what we're going to discuss here with the quantum model is going to be very much related to our next topic, which is electron configurations. So we're going to want to apply a lot of these topics we're describing with these orbitals to the periodic table over here. And as it turns out, the principal quantum number n, this corresponds to the rows on the periodic table. So what that means is, if we look at this periodic table, we know we have all these different rows. If you're in the first row, that means you have electrons in the first shell. So that's the n equals one shell. If you go to on to the other rows, then you've got the first shell, the second shell, third shell, all the way to the seventh shell. What that means is, if you have an atom, for instance, in the third row of the periodic table, the atom has electrons in the first shell, the second shell, and the third shell. Okay, so more about these energy levels or shells, they increase in energy away from the nucleus. So that means that n equals one shell is closest to the nucleus and lowest in energy. As you move from the second shell to the third shell and so forth, you move progressively farther away from the nucleus and you also have higher energy. And these energy level slash shells also get progressively closer together. So that means the energy gap between the first shell and the second shell is the largest. It's gonna be greater than the gap between the second and the third shell, and that gap is gonna be greater than that between the third and the fourth shell, and so forth. These energy levels and shells also have energies that are quantized, which means they have specific discrete energy values. Now, one thing you hopefully have noticed is that these three aspects of energy level slash shells for the quantum model are the same exact ones as what we discussed for the Bohr model. And that's correct. That's one of the reasons why we still talk about the Bohr model today. Even though it was ultimately wrong, there are multiple aspects of the Bohr model that are correct and are applied in the quantum model. However, there's a very important aspect that the Bohr model left out, and that is, in the quantum model, these energy levels slash shells can be further subdivided into subshells. So what that means is, in the Bohr model, every electron in a shell was more or less equivalent. In the quantum model, your electrons in a shell are not necessarily going to have the same amount of energy. You can have electrons in different subshells with same, within that same energy level and have slightly different energies. Okay, so let's take a look at the subshell in a little bit more detail. What's important about it for orbitals is that the shape of the orbital is actually determined by the subshell. The subshell, similarly to the principal quantum number, does correspond to an aspect of the periodic table. And here the subshell represents the different blocks on the periodic table. And you might recall these first two columns we call the S block. These last six columns we call the P block. Our transition metals we call the D block. And our lanthanides and actinides we call the F block. 
This is actually pretty important because for our principal quantum number n, the d block and f block are treated differently. So what I mean by that is for the d block, you have to subtract 1 from the principal quantum number, and for the f block, you have to subtract 2. So for instance, if you take a look at the fourth row of the periodic table, you start with the 4s subshell, and then when you move to the d block, you have the 3d subshell, and then you have the 4p subshell. So just make sure you subtract 1 for the D block and 2 for the F block. All right. Now, when your electrons are in these different subshells, they have orbitals of different shapes. So within the S block, you might recall that you have one spherical orbital. So that means Electrons in the S block, their orbits or their orbitals are just a sphere, a very simple shape. If we move on to the P block, we actually have three dumbbell orbitals. So there's two things to point out here. The first is that the P block orbitals are more complex in shape, right? You have a dumbbell shape as opposed to just a spherical shape. A second aspect is that whereas the S block only contains a single orbital in that subshell, the P subshell contains three orbitals. And when we move on to the D block and the F block, we will have more orbitals in that subshell. We'll also have even more complex shaped orbitals. The good thing for the MCAT is you're only responsible for knowing the shapes of the S and P block orbitals. You don't need to know what the D and F block orbitals look like. However, you do need to know that the D block does have five orbitals and the F block has seven orbitals. Within each orbital, you can have two electrons. This is essentially what is often described as the Pauli exclusion principle and is based on the possible spin values that electrons can have within orbitals. And the electrons can either have an upspin or a downspin, right? You can't have an orbital with two upspins or two downspins. You have to uh, have only an up uh, or a down, right? So because of that, each orbital can only fit two electrons. So as a result, you can actually go back to the blocks and say that the S block, you can have two electrons, and the P block, you can have six electrons, the D block, you can have 10 electrons, and the F block, you can hold up to 14 electrons in that subshell. All right, we'll talk about this more in detail when we look at our next video, looking at electron configurations.